I think we're going to get started with our program. So I just want to say good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Adeline Green, and I am one of the founding members of the Kenosha Coalition for Dismantling Racism. And those of you who have been with us before know that we hold these courageous conversations once every other month, about five times a year, to um, talk about issues specific to racism and how it impacts certain groups of people here in this country. We have a mission. The CFDR mission is to identify and expose racism and to work for racial justice. And we try to do that through these forums by sharing information that provides people with useful knowledge that helps them to better understand some of the real challenges that are faced by people of color. We're happy that you decided to join us this evening in spite of the weather. Um, I know it was snowing earlier, I don't know if it still is, but thank you for coming tonight to listen to this particular courageous conversation that we're calling Indigenous People's Perspectives on Racism, Representation, and Thanksgiving. I think this will be a very impactful conversation that will hopefully give you lots of valuable information. We're grateful to be holding this courageous conversation during November, which has been designated National Native American Heritage Month. And we're pleased to have a panel of people here to share their experiences as Native Americans living in this community, in this state, and I'm sure they're going to give us some valuable information. They will introduce themselves later on in this program. Our program today will be moderated by none other than coalition member Juan Torres, who is sitting here up front. He's a recent uh, Kenosha Unified retiree and has devoted his, some of his retirement time to working with the Coalition for Dismantling Racism, and we appreciate that. And um, he will ask the panelists a variety of prepared questions, and then we will open it up to the audience. And we have some index cards out there somewhere that uh, we will be passing around. And if you have any questions besides the ones that we ask, then you can ask questions on your own. Before Juan comes up to moderate the program, we want to give a brief historical overview on indigenous people here in Wisconsin. And that's going to be given by Bridget Nash, who is a staff member here at the Kenosha Public Museum, the curator of social sciences, did I get that right? Um, she has lots of knowledge and experience with indigenous populations here and other places. So I want to thank you again for coming here tonight. We're excited about this particular program and hope that you will gain lots of information to take back with you and do what you need to do. So, Bridget, would you come forward at this time and give us our historical overview? Thank you. Bridget Nash, in addition to being the Curator of Social Sciences here at the Kenosha Public Museums, I am also a prehistoric archaeologist. Spent most of my time in the Southwest. Um, I was the SIPO, or the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for the Quetzal Tribe uh, in California. And that means that I was the liaison between the tribes and the federal government. So uh, some of our discussion tonight is going to be discussing some of those current issues. Um, that are impacting tribes across uh, the United States and specifically here in Wisconsin. Um, so this is going to be a very brief <laughs> because it's thousands and thousands of years of history in a very small period of time. So I'm going to hit on some of the more major uh, uh, acts um, that kind of shaped where we are now um, and is going to lead into a lot of the discussions that um, the panel is going to have um, here. So the brief history that uh, we're going to talk about is related to the 12 tribal nations here in the state of Wisconsin. Okay? So before we get into that, I want to talk really briefly about the prehistory of the Americas and specifically here in the state of Wisconsin. Um, but I want to 
kind of give you um, a little background on where a lot of this information comes from. Um, a lot of this information is derived from uh, archaeological data. That is, um, when a site is excavated, it's dated, they use dates. Um, and so a lot of tribal knowledge is not incorporated into this prehistory. Um, and that's unfortunate. Um, we will be talking, I will um, discuss a little bit of uh, some work, um, a book that was written by Anton Troyer, um, uh, tying some of that tribal knowledge. And you'll be able to see how the two can, um, they don't have to be mutually exclusive. They can work hand in hand um, to really kind of fill this out. So not to date myself, but a couple decades ago when I was an undergrad, um, the prevailing discussion of prehistory here in North America was the idea that people moved across the, the Bering Strait, about the land bridge, about 10,000 years ago, populating North America. There are other theories that are out there. This one is still kind of the predominant one. However, because of the dating of archeological sites, it's been pushed back to 16 to 20,000 years ago. Okay, so we've pushed that date even further back, which means here in the state of Wisconsin, we've also seen some of those dates change as well. So we know from archeological sites throughout the Americas that humans have been present for 15 to 20,000 years. We also know that the glaciers retreated from the Great Lakes around 12,000 years ago, and that humans have lived in this area ever since. Archaeologists, okay, so we divide and categorize people into different groups based on the time period and the technology present at the site. And this is what you're seeing here. You'll hear terms like Paleo-Indian, you'll hear terms archaic, woodland, Mississippian, Hopewell, okay? Um, unfortunately, each of these categories is discussed as being their own distinct uh, groups of people with the decline of a civilization or the advent of a new te technology um, ushering in the new group of people. So one group disappears, the other group kind of takes its place. And this discussion leads the public to believe that these cultural groups lack a connection through time because of the information being presented as this group of people is dying out and this new uh, group is coming in to replace it. Rather than um, looking at it as groups are inventing or borrowing new technologies and evolving into the next group. So in his book, uh, Cultural Toolbox, Dr. Anton Troyer shares stories about prophets who told the people to move west to a land where food grows on water, which is a reference to the wild rice um, in the Western Great Lakes. Over a period of hundreds of years, thousands of ancient ones started moving west, establishing new villages along the way. Some stayed in the new villages for generations, some still are there, and others pushed on. In his book, Troyer goes on to say that as the people spread out, they changed and diversified with the ancient ones, becoming the 29 Algonquian tribes that include the Andala, Potawatomi, Cree, Menominee, Meskwaki, and Ojibwe. By coupling this tribal knowledge with archeological data, it's not far-fetched to think that before emerging as distinct cultural and linguistic groups, that the ancestors of contemporary tribal nations were located throughout the Americas, and that they moved around in response to the expanding and shrinking of the glaciers. It is also not far-fetched to think that the distinct cultural and linguistic groups that are present today were the same groups that archaeological that archaeologists refer to as the Paleo-Indians, Mississippi, Hopewell, Oneota, and were present over 10,000 years ago. So that is a very quick prehistory leading up to contact, okay? Just to try and um, shift our thinking from group disappear, different group disappear to one of more linear connection through time. So at the time of contact, uh, the Mononami, Ojibwe, Potawatomi, and Hunchuk peoples were among the original inhabitants of Wisconsin. The Oneida, uh, Stockbridge, Muncie, and Brothertown tribal nations moved into the area after contact. And so that initial contact took place with um, when the first European explorer, John Nicolet, um, moved into the, arrived in the region in 1634 as he was searching for the Northwest Passage to China. 
Now, as we said before, I'm going to kind of skip around a little bit to some of those larger, uh, those larger uh, contacts or acts that kind of have shaped um, what we're seeing today. So, we had first contact at 1634, and then in 16 or 1763, the British issued a decree limiting the settlement west of the existing colonial battery, boundary called the Proclamation Line. Now this line was to be respected as the limit to English colonization until the government had signed agreements with the tribes. Of course, the settlers ignored the line and streamed west. And what's, so, what's important is that this decree uh, acknowledged the rights of the tribes back in 1763, acknowledged those land rights. And then, in 1790, the newly established American government recognized the proclamation line and its provisions. However, once again, the settlers chose to ignore the boundaries, ventured further west, and the government protected them because it was preferable to fight the tribes rather than their own citizens. And this leads us to the Indian Removal Act of 1830. So after the War of 1812, um, government policy became one of removal and segregation. Entire cultures were forced west of the Mississippi River, away from white settlements. And this policy was formalized with the Indian Removal Act of 1830. Now between 1776, I'm gonna try and get to this here really quickly, and 1887, the US seized over 1.5 billion acres from tribal nations through treaties and executive orders. Okay. Just so that you can, oh, it's not gonna show. Okay, that's okay. We have a nice little video. I can share the link with you later. That's okay. Sorry about that. We can push that out later. But it shows, um, there's a great video that has compiled all of the, um, the data from trees and acts and puts it into a video showing the land lost as time moves on um, and the establishments of reservations and then the, the, uh, the government then taking back that land um, that they've established as a reservation. Um, so I'm sure I can, we can share that with everybody tonight. I apologize for that. So as a result of the Indian Relocation Act in 1838, General John Tipton began the removal of the remaining Potawatomi in Indiana. On the morning of September 4th in 1838, a band of 859 Potawatomi, with their leaders shackled and restrained in the back of a wagon, set out on a forced march from their homeland in northern Indiana, right in here, um, for a small reservation reserve in present day Kansas. Uh, to minimize the temptation of the Potawatomi to try and escape and to return home, militia members burned all the fields and the houses. Due to the lack of horses and wagons, most were forced to walk the 660 miles. More than 40 people died. Now, manifest destiny is a phrase that was coined in 1845, and this was the cultural belief that Americans had a divine obligation to stretch the boundaries of their noble republic to the Pacific Ocean. This belief empowered white settlers to push west, regardless of who was in the way. So in 1851, the US government created the reservation system to keep Native Americans off of lands of which Americans wished to settle. Many indigenous peoples refused confinement to the reservations, which resulted in a series of conflicts between the Native Americans and the US Army, known as the Indian Wars. Ultimately, the US Army subdued the tribes and forced them onto the reservations, where tribal nations were allowed to govern themselves and maintain some of their traditions and cultures. However, Despite being placed on reservations, white settlers continued to view the practice of native traditions as barbaric and intolerable. They believed that assimilation, assimilation or being completely absorbed into um, the mainstream white American society was the only acceptable fate for Native Americans. 
This belief was often couched in religious terms where many white Christians argued that, the only, that only by abandoning their spiritual traditions and accepting Christian dogma could Native Americans be saved from the fires of hell. So in the late 19th century, a political consensus formed around these ideas, which resulted in the 1887 passage of the Dawes Act. Now, the Dawes Act authorized the president to break up uh, the reservation land into small allotments to be parceled out to individuals. Only those Native Americans who accepted the individual allotments were allowed to become uh, US citizens. And as a result, the remaining lands were then sold to settlers. Um, so because of the lands that were sold, over 90 million acres of tribal land were stripped for Native Americans and sold to non-Natives. In fact, the Ojibwe lost more than 40% of their homelands to the South. So these are some of the larger, um, just so you can get a sense of it. There we go. <coughs> okay, so what this particular video has done has taken all of the treaties that were signed um, with the government, all of the acts that, some of, well, some of which I just mentioned, um, to show, so the blue were all of the traditional lands, the homelands of the tribes, and this shows the pushing west, the removals, you'll start to see orange, which stands for the uh, reservations, you'll start to see those pu pushing up, um, and then you'll see some of them disappear or become smaller as the government goes back in and removes some of the land that they allowed uh, the tribes to have. <coughs> And this is a really good representation of what has taken place. And it has um, a tracker to show all of the acres that have been seized since 1776. So that brings us pretty close to today, because uh, I don't want to go into too, too much, because I know I'm supposed to keep it brief and have these discussions. So I'll get out of the way here. Thank you very much. Just so you know, if you want to win a free book by uh, author Angeline Boley, make sure to put your name in the red box out there. Okay, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, I will introduce each of the panelists uh, individually, and they will have a one minute to expand on their bio. I'm just going to state their name and who they are, or and then they will say a little bit about themselves. First of all, Jeffrey A. Crawford, Attorney General for Forest County, Parawatami Community. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, uh, well, thank you for coming, and Bridget did a great job of covering 20,000 years in uh, <laughs> 10 minutes. Uh, and so, uh, I am the uh, I am a Forest County Potawatomi tribal member. I'm the Attorney General for Potawatomi. I'm a first uh, generation high school grad and one of the first five or six members to graduate college at uh, the University of Stevens Point. Uh, I graduated with a history and political science major. Went on to the University of Michigan Law School. Worked for Fortune 500 learning law firms on campus. And I've been the Attorney General for the uh, Potawatomi for the last 25 years. Thank you. The next is Mary Adams, a retired trial court judge of the Wisconsin Oneida. My name is Inu Siosta, which means I take care of my family. And um, I am part of the Oneotiaga, which is people of the Standing Stone, which you might know us as Oneidas. And I am from the Wolf Clan. I have 
uh, worked at Sherman Indian High School for about 13 years in Riverside, California, which is a boarding school for uh, Native Americans. And this school is not one that they take kids and put in. This is like a gift so that Native Americans can go to school together and see one another as their own race and look like, you know. So um, then I came back to um, Oneida and I worked in as a judge, mostly with uh, child support. Okay, the next is Abigail Davidson, a sophomore at Carthus College of the Bat River Band of Lake Superior of Chicago. Buju, Mashkazigi, and Dujaba, Wabanungu, Kwe, Indijnikaz. Hello, everyone. Uh, my Ojibwe name is Morning Star Lady. My English name is Abby Davidson. Um, I'm a member of the Bad River Band of the Experience Chippewa Indians. Uh, I'm currently a sophomore at Carthage College. Um, I'm studying Allied Health Science Athletic Training. Um, and yeah, thank you for having me speak today. Okay, and the next one is. Uh, Jason Rodriguez, Rodriguez, a junior at UW Parkside of the Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. Uh, Buju, um, Wayne, Indigenous Cows, Mushkazibi, and Ujuba. Um, hello, my name is Jason Rodriguez. I come from uh, Bad River. And um, oh, I'm a member of Red Cliff, but I reside in, um, in Bad River. Um, I'm a junior at UW Parkside. I'm studying accounting. Uh, I hope to be a first gen in my family to graduate college. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, now we're going to be asking the questions, and they're limited to uh, two minutes to respond. Uh, I'm going to go straight just the order they are right now and see. With the essence of time, we might skip a few, okay? So we'll go for the first one, and we'll start from the left with Jeffrey, down to Jason, and we'll, we'll do that right now and see how that goes. <laughs> okay, the first question. There are many stereotypes and misconceptions about tribal nations. What do you think is the best way to challenge and change the narratives that continue to fuel these stereotypes and misconceptions about tribal nations. So, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear me. Good. Uh, so, hi, I'm Jeff Crawford. Uh, so, I'll do my introduction all over again. So, uh, you know, they give certain questions, and they're really hard. Uh, and it really makes you think. So, uh, and so to prepare for this, I didn't write anything down. And so. Uh, one thing I would say in, uh, on the stereotypes and misconceptions is to um, understand that Indians uh, uh, aren't extinct. Uh, we're still here. Um, in fact, where you're sitting right now literally is the home site, uh, campsite you know, uh, of the Potawatomi and a fishing site. Right across the area over there is uh, Potawatomi burial ground. Literally, I could throw a rock over and, and hit a Potawatomi burial ground. And, we have students here from Carthage, which is a Potawatomi site, and Petrified Springs, which is a Potawatomi site with next to the UW Parkside. And uh, you know it here uh, in Kenosha as Sheridan Avenue. Um, that's a Potawatomi trail. Green Bay Avenue, uh, which literally goes all the way up to Green Bay, uh, to the Oneida. Uh, and so this, you, if you understand that the tribe still exists and that we have a presence here, in, in, in this country and in this area, that's a good start, uh, I think. But no, I guess the other thing to keep in mind is that there are 575 or 74 tribes that are recognized uh, in the United States. Uh, and so we're all kind of unique and have a unique history uh, and a different perspective sometimes. Um, so uh, I don't know if that's two minutes or not. Well, um, I'm from the Oneida tribe, and we started out in um, New York, and we fought in the war for um, the Americans, and uh, we, um, I believe, we won that part of that fight, and so we had to get out of there because our own people fought against us, and uh, that's what the Americans did. 
made sure that we fought against each other. And so then we end up um, having to find land where the government or, or they promised that they would find us someplace because they saw the animosity going on there. So we ended up uh, in Menominee land and the government said they they would purchase the Menominee land for us. And sadly to say, they never gave Menominee the money. So guess what? They didn't like us for many, many years because our payment wasn't paid. But now they finally got, we got together and we're okay with it. But um, we also, so we're not, this wasn't our land at all. This was these guys, Menominees and other tribes from around here. And so um, we've made do and we like our land and don't wanna leave it or anything. So um, I think that the uh, stereotypes and the misconceptions um, that we have with our tribe is some of the things that we, when we, when we talk, we look eye to eye. But when Americans talk, we're supposed to go like this and not look at the person. And so, the, you know, we have misconceptions on how we, we um, are raised and stuff. And, and a, lot of, a lot of things are now meshed in with other societies or, or other um, people. And so we're almost like everybody else. But there is still some things that linger in our feelings on um, and how we uh, how we're able to raise our children and and be as Indians on the reservation. And um, since when we came here, we were brought here by uh, different types of churches, like um, Catholics and Protestants and. The ones that came up as traditionals were very, very small amount of people, and the, mo the majority of the, the um, traditionals that left New York went to Canada. So we have the traditionals there, and mostly here are um, religious, uh, as far as um, you know, one of the churches. So we are building our traditions up now as we talk, as we speak. We had to go get us a um, chief because we didn't, of course, they didn't want to help any of those type of people. You had to be in a church in order to to even get a place to live here. Otherwise, we lived out in the snow until the traditions, a lot of them perished because they were unable to find um, heat or food. But I'll go ahead. I think it's two minutes. I don't know what two minutes are. Uh, uh, um, I would say that the best way to challenge and change these narratives is to definitely just do the little things in educating yourself. Um, it baffles me how many college kids don't even know what a tribe is, claim they've never met a na native person before, um, just they just don't know anything about native people. Um, and I definitely think that just results from doing the little things, you know, having conversations like this, um, going to powwows, you know, making yourself uncomfortable where you can learn new things um, and just even asking just we, we're not afraid to we're, we're not going to be mean and, and, and like and talk to you about our culture because it's something we're proud of um, and yeah I would just say I'm um, definitely doing the little things and speaking up when you hear those misconceptions um, when talking to other people I don't know how many times I've heard that people think that um, tribes are getting free money from the government which is not true at all um, just so, just a lot of things that like um, people could definitely be just educating themselves. Yeah. Um, I would say a big thing is uh, again what she said, like coming to these. Like I commend each and every one of you for coming out and just listening to us. Um, it's just uh, it's just a good way to show that um, we are just more than what these stereotypes say we are. That we're just um, people just like every other person out there. Next question, I'm gonna jump. How do you personally regard the holiday of Thanksgiving? Is it considered to be a day of celebration or a day of mourning in your tribal community? Yeah, I, I grew up poor, so uh, when I think of uh, Thanksgiving, uh, I think of standing in the line for the church to get a free meal 
uh, during Thanksgiving or standing in line at Salvation Army to get a free turkey. Um, and I also think of, it was kind of odd as a child to see uh, the celebration with these Indians and the pilgrims. And it seemed, uh, I couldn't articulate it at the time and I didn't think about it at the time, but it really puts you kind of in an odd spot given you know what your real life experience is and how you're celebrating uh, this event. Uh, and you know, nobody ever said, you know, who were those Indians, whether they're still alive and what the hell happened that we got to this point where we're standing in line, you know, trying to get handouts for, for, for this time period. But now I would say uh, it's not a time of mourning because in many respects, you know, the fall is the time of harvest. And I think um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a happy time because you, all the work and you, you brought all the field uh, crops in and you brought all your uh, gathering and, and, and you, you have feasts. Um, and so uh, for me personally, and, uh, you know, it's, it's about family and that's the way I think about it. Um, but uh, uh, it, it, it is a confusing time uh, if you are a, a young American Indian or Native American and seeing those images and what it really, how it applies to your family, it's, it's, it can be very confusing, it was confusing. You know? Well, when I was young, we didn't celebrate Thanksgiving. We were probably too poor to do that. Um, I don't think we started celebrating it um, probably more like uh, the 70s, something like that. And it wasn't so much of a celebration, it was that people would put a um, box of food out and, and sneak it out there. They really didn't come to us and knock on the door or anything. All of a sudden, my mom says, someone's outside. And we go out there, and there's food. And we go, oh, OK. So wow, somebody gave us some food. Thank you. So we, whatever's in there, we cooked it up. So it wasn't a celebration when I was young. And um, as we got older, and now the way that uh, we, since we have learned that what happened on Thanksgiving, which that was um, our tribe, yeah, the Iroquois, and that the Six Nations, which later turned to the Six Nations because we had a tribe come, come forward and belong to us. But um, we, um, in that um, Six Nations and us, we open, well, when you hear the story about you know, um, let's see, all you know, all the pilgrims that came and they started to, you know, couldn't feed themselves off the land because they didn't know what to eat and what not to eat, and we cooked the meal and we helped them out. And you know, we're really, really, um, how do you say it? We're giving people, we're trusting people. We are them kind of people that, and probably a lot of us are like that today. We take in a lot of people. My mom had nine girls and three boys, and if somebody came to our house and wanted to stay there, we make room. Doesn't matter if it wasn't one tortilla you get, that's it for the day. If you don't have any place to stay, you're gonna eat the same thing we eat. And so um, we are the type of people that didn't start a war. We weren't those kind of people. So um, we were taken advantage of. And so I guess all the, um, things that happened today with this kind of stuff started on the uh, east side. You know, and that was us. Okay. <laughs> I keep trying to do this. Um, I would say we celebrate Thanksgiving, I guess. Like, we eat a meal. Like, we, I just regard it as a day to, like, get together with my family and we give thanks for everything that Creator has given us. Um, honestly, I didn't, it was really confusing for me growing up. Honestly, I looked at, like, Oh, the pilgrims and the Indians, like those those Indians aren't my Indians, like that I'm not them, you know, like we're that didn't happen to our, our Indians, but it did. And um, once I got high school and middle school, like I actually was like, wait, that doesn't seem right. Um, and now, like even like I think last year I just realized I was like that was like one of the biggest acts of genocide that our people have faced like ever, like and that was one of the first things that has ever happened to us 
Um, and so I asked my mom, can we just call it the day where we just have a meal all together and give thanks? Let's just not call it Thanksgiving because I don't like that term anymore. Um, so yeah, but I celebrate Thanksgiving, but I don't like to call it Thanksgiving, I guess. So. Um, when I was a kid, I didn't really understand like Thanksgiving. Like all I saw was food on the table, and so I was like, okay, time to eat. But um, growing up to where I am now, and like the, from what I've learned about Thanksgiving, it kind of makes it look at it. I look at it a little differently now. But um, most of the, most of uh, it, I just see it as a time where me and my family get together and we enjoy the time that we have together. Thank you. Next question. There are many terms used when referring to members of tribes, Indians, Native Americans, American Indians. Which terms are most appropriate for talking about North American, what's North America's person? There, there's no right answer uh, about this. When I was a, a kid living in northern Wisconsin, you know, they would call us timber N-words. Uh, the N word, no. And so, uh, but I grew up in the 60s and the 70s, and then, uh, the American Indian movement came around. So, American Indian was the popular phrase. And then at some point, that got uh, morphed into the uh, Native Americans. Uh, and uh, I'm okay with that, too. Uh, and nowadays, uh, the, uh, the term is, uh, that's coming popular is uh, indigenous people. And uh, I'd say if I had to pick, I'd pick indigenous people because I think it's more accurate, um, but it's also international. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, but um, I, I, I don't lose sleep over this. Uh, uh, a lot of people do. Um, but, uh, you know, I think when you're a bunch of Indians are together, we don't call ourselves, hey, indigenous, uh, you, know, you know, Mary or. Uh, and if anything, you know, uh, we did what we did today. You know, what tribe are you from? What band are you from? Because, you know, we're an Indian, but we're also Oneida, Ojibwe, Bad River, uh, Red Cliff, uh, Potawatomi. Uh, so um, I, think, I think there's just too much um, time spent on figuring that terminology out. Long ago, um, like my parents, and um, they call themselves Indians, and if they're still alive, that's what they call themselves right now. They stay with the word Indians. And um, as we look at our younger people, they call themselves Natives, point blank. They're not American Natives, not Native Americans, they're Natives. And um, if, and me, I look at it like we're Indians or Natives first then we're Americans. That's the way it should be, not Americans first, but that's just the way I look at it, and I'll be called uh, Native American, or um, it doesn't matter to me, really. Um, yeah, I would agree. A lot of young people now, we call ourselves Natives, um, but uh, me personally, I, I would rather that term, uh, the term Indian doesn't really sit right with me all that much. I'm sure you could probably why because we're not from India, um, but uh, even though Christopher Columbus thought we were. Um, so um, yeah, I prefer the term, I prefer the term native or indigenous, um, but like when natives talk to one another, we refer, oh, I'm Red River, oh, I'm Red Cliff, you know, so. Um, so kind of going off of what, um, what Jeff said, about um, I'm not really losing sleep about what I'm called at the end of the day and um, what I refer to others because I don't refer to other people as as what he said. Yeah, I don't call. I don't walk up to another Native American and go, oh, hey, how's it going, Native American? How you doing? But um, I'll just refer to them as their name, or, and I'll ask them. But um, I think that's okay. Next question is. Current generational traumas, or those passed from generation to generation, in the form of historical oppression, violence, and systemic racism. However, <clears throat> generational traumas also lead to re resiliency and strength. 
which gives way to advocacy, social change, and continued empowerment. What is your experience with transgenerational resiliency in the face of trauma, and how has it created an environment for continued solutions for overcoming oppression, violence, and systemic racism? So I told you they had some hard questions in there. And so, uh, the, the, so the generation after generation of trauma and the ill effects of it, you know, the important thing is to break the cycle. Um, and then once you break through, then, you know, hopefully the, the, the generations after you don't have to experience that. And so, you know, within our tribe, we never left Wisconsin, even though you saw the removals that were going on in Indiana. There were also removals that were going on here in Wisconsin with the other bands, uh, in, in Teresa, in Milwaukee, in McGuanico, and all, uh, all of those areas. And so our, our tribe experience was that we were always on the run. And we were always um, trying to stay ahead of the government because the government and the settlers uh, kept on pushing us from this area, literally where I'm sitting, further, further north. And the way we survived was to um, blend in with other tribes or hide into the forest. And so the distrust of government uh, is something that still exists. Uh, the attempts to remove us, uh, uh, we, we, that is a generational thing. It, it, it's, you, you really see it in the area of education. Our, we have a documented history of trying to avoid mainstream education. Uh, because that meant they were going to take your child away into boarding school. And my mother is a product of, of boarding school, and that's where the language ended uh, in, in, in my family. And so, um, but we're now, as a tribe, breaking through that and saying we are going to educate our children, and we've created a pipeline of, of children that uh, exist. Social problems, uh, you know, with poverty, associated with poverty, you know, um, alcoholism. You gotta break that cycle. Um, uh, domestic abuse, uh, you know, it's part you know, poverty, but it's also how our women were treated um, uh, by uh, other uh, other Indians, but also by the white men. And so that is still an ongoing thing. Even though we have all kinds of programs and whatnot, uh, trying to end domestic uh, violence uh, against the women is, is another big, um, issue but again i'll go right back to it you have to be sort of self-aware individually but as a community what what is going on here it's a, and then you know, almost have an intervention with yourself or with the community and say we have to break this cycle well our creation story started with um a female falling from the sky and um falling on a turtle and then we were created. So uh, women in our genera our, our tribe held very highly and they are the ones that really dictated. Well, I guess maybe the men did, but the women were behind them making sure that you better say the right thing. Okay, and if you don't, I'm gonna get you. So um, then when, when the settlers came, they changed everything and so the reason why they did is because in I guess in Roman and, and wherever they came from England and all that the men ruled and so it, it made us like we didn't know where our position was because they don't want to talk to the women they want to talk to the chiefs and stuff like and without us being there now that's a no-no you're not going to talk to a chief without grandmothers being there. There's no way. And so there was a, a struggle because the men felt, well, maybe that's the right thing to do, a new way, you know? And so we were, I, I think, at least that's with our, our reservation, that's how we helped it. And um, the traumas, I think the worst traumas were the boarding schools. And they took our children away from us, and that's my mother's generation and stuff, took the children away, so therefore they didn't know how to be parents. And so, and that's going on today as the, some of the fathers, the men in our, in our um, reservation, they're the ones who are taking care of the children. The women are 
not necessarily taking care of them like they should be. They weren't taught to be mothers and fathers at uh, um, boarding schools. They weren't. They were stripped of our language, stripped of our um, closeness to our family. They were stripped of everything that you could strip us from. And um, besides that, they, um, many of our children died uh, at these boarding schools. And I don't know if you've heard it in the news the last few years or several years, that um, there's bodies in there they don't know who it belongs to. And so they're trying now to find out where they go. And a lot of them kids that went to the boarding schools never returned back to the reservation. And if they did turn back, they are now Christians. They are now Catholics. They don't know anything about the ceremonies and things. And so then the Indian, their own aunties, uncles, they didn't want them there because you don't even know what to do. And you're trying to preach to us nonetheless. Trying to, you know, so it, it was a real struggle and it has been. And, you know, it's starting to settle down. And uh, Navajos had a really big problem with that because Utah would just come in there and take anybody they want. They're right there. We're, we're way over here on the East Coast. And so it was a little bit more difficult for us. Oh, time goes fast. <laughs> um, I just want to say, uh, I believe our generation experienced um, and witnessed transgenerational trauma firsthand um, because our parents and our grandparents were heavily, heavily affected by the boarding schools and by oppression, by racism. Um, they were, they lived in the height of it. And honestly, like, well, in like poverty, and um, so I just feel very blessed, like be able to go to college, be able to even be speaking here to you, to you today. Um, and I, I look back at what I know, like my ancestors, my grandparents, my mom, like what they went through, and I'm angered, but I'm also empowered. I want to advocate for my people. I want to speak out about these misconceptions and stereotypes, um, and I feel like that. I don't speak for my whole generation, but I can see that a lot now with my age, kids are wanting to do more for our people. We're wanting to speak out more, and we're wanting to break break the cycle um, that we have seen happen for so long. Um, so yeah, I would just say, um, me personally, um, looking at um, the trauma that my family, my ancestors have faced, um, I just feel really empowered, and I feel. Um, blessed that they have given me this position where I can be who I am. Okay. Uh, do any of you know and or speak a native tribal language? Explain why or why not. I, I do not speak, uh, as I said, um, my grandparents um, and their generation spoke, and my mother, um, that was cut off um, uh, by the boarding schools. Um, and, and so we are now bringing back the language, the native speakers that are the elders, um, we're, we're, we're invigorating that uh, again, so it's not lost. Um, so, I, but I, I don't personally speak. Has anyone heard of the code talkers? Well, my child is um, part of the code talkers. And the reason why is because it's so hard to speak our language. Now, all you have to do is say one word, and you have to stop it. Okay, so that's a word, but that's not the easy word. But, and then, if you let the word go, it means something different. That's why the code talkers, it was, they couldn't break our language. And nor can I. <laughs> I'd rather learn Spanish, <laughs> really. And my sisters, um, I have about four sisters out of the nine, well, eight sisters, but they speak and they, they um, are teaching. But even though it takes a lifetime to really speak it, all they're doing is reading words or learning phrases, but it's not a conversational piece like you know, like every time we talk to each other, we say, you know, get ready to leave. It's nogiwa. Nogiwa means I will see you later. 
We're not saying goodbye, we'll see you later. Sogoli, hello, waste just leave. You know, I have these little words that I can tell you, and, but I can't speak the language and I, I, you know, I don't know, I think I'd like to do a lot of things, read books and stuff, but I'm slowly going in there and learning some of the language my, sis my sister teaches every Wednesday and, you know, and so I think that we should be speaking our language, but there's so many good things to do. <laughs> <It's bad. laughs> um, I don't personally speak it. Like, like she said, I speak like phrases and I know um, some words, um, but I will say um, it's, it's growing a lot in our tribes, especially with Ojibwe. Um, we're getting it in our high schools. Uh, we have immersion schools. Um, Lakuta Ray is a tribe in Hayward, Wisconsin. Um, they have an entire immersion school where children are learning Ojibwe as a second language, um, which I think is really awesome. Like preschool kids are speaking both English and Ojibwe. Um, and it's just an ongoing effort. And it's, it's other, other tribes, like my tribe, um, they're starting it at the Head Starts. And so they're being um, influenced by the Lakuta Immersion School. But um, I would also say that I know a lot of UW schools um, they're working to get Ojibwe as a foreign language at UW schools. Um, those random ones at UW Madison, um, I know it's one. Um, but I think it's really cool how um, it's being considered like uh, actual foreign language now. Um, and I hope to learn more uh, as I grow older. But yeah. Um, okay. Not to sound like a broken record, but um, I know like bits and pieces. Uh, don't ask me to go past my introduction because I don't know. Um, I know little words, but um, I personally think that the, the language is very important, especially um, within the community. Um, my mom has been working with the tribe for over two years to not only implement and teach the youth, but also teach the, um, the, older, the older people about the language so that they themselves can learn and they can pass it on down to um, their children. Okay. Next question. What are some of the most important issues that Native American communities are facing in the United States? Are the issues different across tribal nations or between generations? Well, I think the language discussion is a, a very good example um, because you, you need to continue the language to continue the culture. And uh, I think every tribe recognizes that. Um, and, uh, every one of the tribes on this table uh, have programs and uh, we've published our own dictionary. We have our own language classes uh, and it's uh, the, all of the street names are now uh, in, in Potawatomi and, uh, and so it's, it's, it's beginning, you know, and I think other cultures have been close to losing their language. So language and culture is a big issue um, from, I'm a lawyer and so one of the things that uh, when I grew up, the champions for Indian rights, you know, were, you know, you either do the protesting, uh, and you take over buildings, and you try to make a point. And, uh, uh, but the other thing that was happening in the 60s and the 70s were that lawyers uh, were fighting for tribal rights, and they were winning uh, some of those cases uh, uh, to the Supreme Court. And it was fundamental in terms of asserting and uh, extending tribal sovereignty. Today is the exact opposite. You know, the last thing you as a tribe probably want to do is be in court because you don't want to get to this United States Supreme Court. And uh, this Supreme Court is rewriting a lot of major issues, uh, including their views on tribal sovereignty. And it's sort of going back to, they're not making this stuff up. This is, this, a lot of this is going back to the old debates of uh, what is a United States, what's a government, a federal government, what rights do they have, what uh, rights do a state have, what rights do a tribe uh, have within the state uh, and the federal government. And they're also focusing on race issues. Well, tribes aren't a race, we're a political entity recognized in the Constitution and the Supreme court cases and federal law and executive orders and uh, state laws. But, you know, litigation on, on those kinds of issues is sort of a race-based analysis. So you want to stay away from 
uh, those kinds of things. Um, and so um, I guess the other big challenge is, you know, and it makes me so happy that we have these uh, young ones here because uh, uh, there's some wisdom coming out of them. And uh, I, that just makes me um, very happy. Maybe um, back uh, in the 70s, you recall um, our right to religion, and that's uh, on the West Coast. They had the right uh, to, um, well, they didn't have the right to, to uh, have in, they call it now Native American church, which um, also uses peyote in part of their, um, their religious efforts. And um, that took a whole lot of work to get the, the right to do our, well, this isn't ours on this side of the country, it's theirs because it grows in that area. That's why they have peyote in their area and we don't in ours. And uh, land rights is um, a big issue because they're finding oil on that land. They want, and so they don't want the Native Americans to get the, the oil rights or the residuals for that. They want to keep them, the United States. Um, blood quantum, um, right now, most tribes go down to one-fourth. Our tribes, and if you, your blood quantum goes down to one-fourth, what happens when you uh, keep marrying and having kids by non-tribal members, then your child now has to be able to uh, go to the same Native American schools. We have a school that um, if, even if you married someone, who had kids that are not even one speck Indian in them, they can go to the schools. You can also go to the, um, like to work out or uh, clinics and stuff like like that. I'm not sure if they can, they, they can, um, I, yeah, they can go to the clinics until they become 18 years old. Then they, if they're not Indian at all, they can do things up into, um, because the, the government says, well, they're not on the rolls, they don't have a enrollment number, so they can't do these several things. So uh, that's, that's still at issue for us, and especially with the, um, with the gaming cost. Now, you know, California pays a whole lot of gaming cost. We don't pay as much gaming cost. If we use that money for certain things, you're supposed to be able to get that money back, and like, like right now we're at two, a PL280 um, tribe, and most of the tribes here are, except for Menominee. But um, in that, we get uh, fire protection, and we get police protection, and we're supposed to get um, education and health and stuff like that it comes from the state. Well, if we're non-PL280, we get none of that, and we take care of ourselves. And that's what Menominee does. They take care of themselves. They were pronounced non-Indians, I believe in the 50s or 40s, and then in uh, 73, Ada Deer turned it around and helped give them back, or she was Menominee too, so helped get their land back. So, you know, we if you're doing really well like Menominee was, they had all this wood and all this, this they had a beautiful mill going on, is from what I heard. And when that was all stripped to them, the few things that were given to them were these other things that they had to put their money into. Well, they flopped, and they haven't really responded back up to work or near where they were. And so things like that can happen at any time with the community. You know, we can get something stripped and then turn around and wait until it all falls and then give it back. You know, so. Um, the first thing I thought of when I saw this question is uh, substance abuse. Um, it is, is, has been a problem for a really long time with tribes. Uh, it continues to be a very big problem. Not only alcohol abuse, which is very bad. Natives are five times more likely to become addicted to alcohol than any other um, group. Uh, but also opioids, narcotics, this, this is a really big crisis. Um, on reservations right now. Um, yeah, really, really, really bad. And this results directly from, uh, like I said, I'm empowered by trans transgenerational trauma. Well, some people are still feeling the hard effects of it, mental health struggles. Um, you know, if you're, if, 
a child sees their parents using drugs, well, they probably will use drugs sometime in their life also. Um, it just keeps getting passed down, um, and that's a big thing that a lot of tribes are trying to you know, combat and try to find ways to get better. Um, also, another issue, um, missing and murdered indigenous women. Um, this is a big topic that's not very spoken about in the news. It should be. Um, Native women are seven times more likely to be missing and murdered than any other uh, group of women um, ever. Um, and it's just baffling to me how it's just not talked about at all. A lot of people don't know this. Um, so, uh, yeah. um, one big problem that I see sometimes is how other youth that are ready to cut ties from their background, they're not ready to take that with them and teach that to their kids or teach it to other people. That um, that once they grow up and they and they'll just forget about their past and um, and that's honestly it's a little sickening to me. Um, I hope to pass um, not only the traditions but the things I've learned from like my mom and all the elders that have, um, that have taught me all these things that I hope to teach to my children one day. And um, going back to what Abby said about uh, drug and alcohol abuse. Um, growing up in a small community, it's um, like I've known people personally that have fallen victim to that, and so like you can definitely tell like the atmosphere, the whole atmosphere changes around the whole community when um, when people fall victim to that, and so I just uh, I see that as uh, yeah, it's a huge problem in today. It's not only for uh, just my nation, but um, other across all tribal nations in general. Many businesses and organizations have been publishing land acknowledgments. However, there has been some back backlash from several tribes regarding the land acknowledgments. Can you share with us what a land acknowledgment is, what the issues have been, and possible steps forward? Okay, so I gotta be honest, I had to look up what is a land acknowledgment. Uh, and uh, so now I think I know what it is. I actually, the first time I saw uh, a land acknowledgement, my son had graduated from college um, last year in the uh, opening prayer they did uh, at the commencement, a land acknowledgement. And I, I remember saying this is really kind of cool because, um, you know, it, it was, it is the tribe um, from that particular college at the time. And, and so really it's just a, a recognition at the, at the beginning of a presentation or a, a speech or you know some sort of event that you know uh, we're here on Potawatomi land and we just want to make sure we acknowledge that uh, and so it's, it's and you can get more elaborate on that and um, so uh, I personally think it's a, a really good thing because it makes me stop and think you know uh, just like my, I was saying okay that's the Quinnip backs uh, land and uh, you know I know they're still in existence I, I know that uh, and so on and so forth but um, I think this is another example of people overthinking things uh, and uh, uh, you know the controversy that if, if it does exist is uh, is it being done respectfully um, I mean, do you really know the history of the this land and the people uh, that were here, uh, uh, or is uh, and, and I guess the other thing that they, they are worried about, scholars I guess maybe, are it's it it might be kind of easy to just sort of do the land acknowledgement. Okay, check we did the politically correct thing, and then we can move on. And it then um, you know sort of ignores the trauma uh, behind all of that. And uh, and I see the point, um, but you know, as, as as one of the young ones said, you know, you got to do a, a lot of little things when it comes to racism and recognizing Indigenous people, American Indians, and I, I think if you do little things uh, and, and repeat them, uh, you can do big things. But I mean, a land acknowledgement is, a, I think, a good thing. Um, and it, it, you know, and it's not probably the intent of the land acknowledgement, but when I, I think of it, I think historically who's here, but I also start thinking of the earth. Um, and you know, when you go to a uh, tribal government meeting, uh, powwow, uh, meal, there's always a prayer. Um, 
and the separation of church and state doesn't exist. Um, but it's, it's always talking about you know, the earth uh, and the sky and the water. And you know, to me, it's, it's, it's a good uh, grounding for me to say, okay, I need to get my brain and my soul thinking about what I'm here to do today. Um, but uh, I'd say keep, good, keep doing them, but just make sure you do them in a respectful manner. Well, we're known as the keepers of the land, and that's all Native Americans. And it's from there that starts um, a big issue with, uh, it's more important to have papers like this. So we have to have somebody who runs our water in order to give us paper. But there's other ways that are coming up, and I think that now that we've had this global warming, we have to and have been the people that you know study this have been changing their ways on things because uh, global warming is coming a lot faster than I thought it was. I thought it'd be long gone before it got to this point, and our rivers and, and stuff are all um, starting to go away, and um, we're having this kind of weather and, and whatnot, and all of a sudden, boom! I think it's real. It's been real for a long time, and we um, we have not been we're we're these we're this small of a population compared to the rest of the population. So, you know, we can only take care of so much, and we all have to live here. So we're all going to have to use some of the native ways because that's what saved us in the first place. That's what saved us natives in order to uh, live for generation and generation. What did she say? You know, how many thousands and years have we, you know, lived here and been able to take care of it. And that's what we have to keep stressing to our younger and um, people around you who said, it's important to all of us now because we're all in this together. Um, so I will say we are working on getting uh, land acknowledgement at Carthage. I don't even like calling it that um, because when I think of the land acknowledgement, I honestly just think of, oh, we acknowledge that we're on this tribe's land. All right, let's move on. Check, let's check, check the box. We we did that, you know. Um, but you know, I think um, the point of the land acknowledgement one is to show, you know, accepting of your history. Um, this is common with a lot of colleges are doing land acknowledgements now. Um, um, but I think a good land acknowledgement would be, you know, looking to the future, wanting to build relationships with native people, tribes, the tribe your your land is on, um, you know, that that would mean more to me than recognizing you're on my land, if, uh, if that makes sense. Um, but I will say one of the issues we've uh, had with doing uh, a land acknowledgement at Carthage is um, a lot of tribes have been through this area, you know, just, just as he said, um, there's a big, you know, we're right on Lake Michigan, a lot of tribes moved through here. Um, so um, I think one of our big things is not only closing it off to one tribe saying we're on this tribe's land, but we recognize that a lot of like native people were here um, and we want to build relationships with native people, you know. We want to look for scholarships for native students. We want to bridge the gap between, uh, for native tribes um, to bring more students here. Um, so yeah, I would say that's what I would look for in a land acknowledgement rather, rather than just, you know, plain recognizing you're on the land. Um, so, yeah. Um, well, I do respect um, a land acknowledgement. I think it's a step in the right direction. And um, I like how it makes people think about where they at and like the history of that land. But I always think that there could be more to be done. Um, kind of basing off what Jeff said, it's just another check mark to go through. Um, but I feel like there could be more rather than just uh, linking up with the, the tribe just to say, oh, we're going to do this land acknowledgement and then leave it at that. Um, I'd rather they do, do more to support them, like have them involved in more things rather than just bring them along just to say, oh, hey, it's, these, it's their land. That's it. Okay, we have one more question to go. And this is it. Some states celebrate Columbus Day, while other states celebrate 
Indigenous Peoples Day. Why is Columbus Day problematic? When did Indigenous Peoples Day begin? And how does shifting to Indigenous Peoples Day counter this problem? Well, I mean, the problem is uh, that uh, Christopher Columbus uh, discovered America uh, and uh, then started killing everyone uh, and uh, trying to enslave them. Uh, and uh, uh, I think back before COVID, I uh, got to travel to uh, Curacao. Just off the coast of Venezuela. Uh, so I went to the local maritime museum. Uh, I like going to museums. Uh, and they just had an excellent, excellent uh, history of, of Curacao. And, and it started out with Christopher Columbus showing up one day and killed all the natives and relocated them. And then he did it through the entire Caribbean. And so, you know, that's why, you know, it's not, it's it, it just, that's not right. That shouldn't be celebrated. This is not an anti-Italian thing. I, I think the Italian people should have a celebration because good, goodness knows that they've done great things and great things in this country uh, and, and they're great Americans. But to latch on to that person and his history of what he did to an entire uh, country say beyond what he said because it's it's all the way true there's not too much to add to that um i it's it's kind of hard to say yeah oh, this was the guy who really destroyed our people and let's have great dinner for it you know and so i think it is just like you put it is it's, it's very difficult to think about in those terms so we think about it in other terms it's a chance that our uh, kids are coming home from school, chance of days off of work, uh, different things like that will, you know, put food on the table for that reason and not much more for Mr. Cummins. Um, I won't talk any more about Christopher Columbus because no more time needs to be spent on it. Um, but um, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day, I think is really cool. Um, you know, now I'm home mom, awesome um, but I just think uh, it's a good day to remind people um, we're not extinct uh, we're still here um, there's a lot of resources you can go reach out to um, I know me personally um, my social media you know is flooded with um, um, happy indigenous people's day posts and that really made me happy um, so yeah that's kind of what I have to say about that um, before as a kid I just saw Christopher Columbus Day as a, oh, hey, it's another day off of school. That's, that's good. But um, as I've grown up, as I've grown and I've learned um, like the true meaning of what Columbus has done, uh, I definitely look at it now in a different way other than that. And um, going off of what Abby said, um, social media is a huge, is a huge power to, um, to have because it's uh, the power to spread uh, whatever you want, to whoever you want. And um, I'm glad that Indigenous Peoples Day has become a thing and is, um, is spreading as fast as it is now. Okay, why don't we give uh, our panelists a hand before we start with the question. <laughs> we're gonna start with the questions from the public, from the participants. If anyone has a question, write it down. a short question they can ask, they can do that. Verbally? Yeah. Verbally? Oh, okay. Um, instead of writing it down, I'll ask. 
Uh, since Jeff opened, opened the door, uh, I had a question regarding uh, the Supreme Court's uh, decision on tribal sovereignty. And I know you said, you had mentioned that if the tribes are, are going to try to avoid having to go to the Supreme Court so that there isn't a challenge, but do you feel like that's the solution to prevent any more losses from the tribes um, with regards to the federal government's involvement um, in many issues that are going to re uh, that are going to be regards to the tribal the tribes. So um, uh, I, I don't know if I need to repeat the question, but or at least as I understood it. So if if the Supreme Court in litigation were a way for uh, tribal communities to uh, assert and defend and establish tribal sovereignty, and the court is not the, uh, necessarily receptive to that. Do we, do we give up on the, the Supreme Court? I'd say. So the answer I don't think is, is no, um, but you better be really careful uh, of the, what you are going to be litigating. There are some things that are just so dang silly that you gotta say, why did you litigate that because you just uh, uh, made it difficult for Indian country. And so, uh, you know, there was a case years ago where a tribe uh, was uh, in a contract dispute with a roofing contractor, and uh, they tried to assert sovereign immunity. Every government has uh, sovereign immunity. But it was over a roofing contract. Took it all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, hey, when you agreed to this arbitration clause, you waive sovereign immunity. I can't tell you how hard that's been to deal with from a legal perspective on how you're going to be contracting things. It was a silly lawsuit and it shouldn't have been litigated. But you know, there there also have been some uh, victories uh, with this Supreme Court, and surprisingly so when it comes to uh, treaty uh, rights, uh, and surprisingly so. Um, uh, but to me, it's kind of a high risk gamble to take it up that way. Uh, and so, uh, since I know the Packers are playing tonight, you know, if, if you can't run the ball, then throw the ball. And so there are other options uh, for tribes. And so, uh, for instance, uh, we can, uh, our relationships with state governments um, and uh, working uh, with uh, the legislatures in the state. You know, um, so one of the cases that are up before the Supreme Court, um, I just argued, uh, had to do with the challenge of the Indian Child Welfare Act. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, that's the one where the children are taken from the Indian families and put into non-Indian families. And it's, it's a good law and it's done good things, many good things. Um, but, you know, guess what? Uh, Wisconsin tribes worked with Wisconsin and, and we codified it in state law. So we have a backup in Wisconsin uh, through Wisconsin statutes that if the Supreme Court strikes that down, we have a backup. Um, the other thing that you can do is, uh, uh, is, is start a certain and doing your own laws. Um, and, and, and so we, we, we've been increasing the number of laws that we have been passing uh, to sort of solidify our sovereignty. Okay. This question is when I make it open, whoever wants to answer. Um, how do you feel about the Columbus statue in Kenosha? Should we remove it? Anybody, anybody that wants to ask? I have not seen it. I'm sorry. We should remove it. But it should be removed. Jason, remove it? Okay. There was actually two questions, the same, uh, the same question. Okay. And, uh, please explain tribal structure, tribe, band. What's the difference, I guess? So, um, it, it, it's uh, if every tribe has got a unique history and, and, and in many respects uh, 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 their structure may be different. Um, and so I said this earlier, there's 574 tribes uh, and we all kind of do things a little bit differently. And then, you know, put this in context, the United States has 100 senators and what, 425 House of Representatives, that's 525 type 
uh, people. They have their own jurisdictions, their own constituents. They have different ways of doing things. You gotta think about tribes sort of like uh, uh, that. But uh, generally, a uh, tribe will have a, a, a governing document. In our case, uh, it's a Indian Reorganization Act Constitution, and it's a federal law that created a constitution uh, and a governing structure. Um, so uh, in, in our case, we, we adopted that in the 1930s, and uh, we still exist under that. Um, so uh, it's more like a corporate structure, and then uh, uh, you elect the uh, elected officials, and they manage the day-to-day -day affairs of the uh, tribe. Um, you know, the, but the interesting thing about that is that um, uh, before that, we had chiefs. So literally, uh, you know, when the day we adopted uh, our current form of government, the chiefs were set aside in terms of, you know, they might be recognized culturally, but politically by the government. Now you're dealing with a chairman or a president, uh, uh, and so uh, it was a big trade-off. Um, but uh, uh, you know, each tribe is organized different. Uh, I think the Oneida have a business council or something. We do have a business business committee, but he did go through almost everything you need to know about how they were arranged. What I wanted to just let you know that um, the United States government based their government on the Iroquois, which is now, like I said, the Six Nations. But um, we had the, the Little Brothers, which was the Oneidas and the Mohawks. If you wanted to do some kind of uh, trading or, or what are they trapping and selling and stuff like that, you would come and face the little brothers, which would be our tribe. The sec, and then say if we said no, no, say we said yes, you can uh hunt, -huh, but you have to get the older brothers okay on it. So they have to go to the next set, what was the Cayugas and the Senecas. And so if they say yeah, then it still then has to go to the Onondagas. And the Onondagas are like the, but it's that that's it. You can't you you can't um, do it. He says no. So you have to start all over again. But you can only ask three times, and so that's where you get the bills coming. You know, it can only come three times. So our um, government is based off of that, but we don't have chiefs really. In per se, we have um, the Onondaga, which really was the ruler to all of us, and that was back um, in uh, New York. I'm going to do another question. Have tribes formed alliances across the continent? I didn't hear you speak a little Have tribes formed alliances across the continent? Okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll use the Potawatomi as an example. Um, the Potawatomi have an annual gathering um, uh, of the Potawatomi bands. And so, um, the, uh, there are about uh, three or four or five bands of Potawatomi uh, in Canada. Remember the Indian removal we were talking about? And remember how sometimes we uh, uh, side with the British and sometimes with the uh, colonists and sometimes with the Americans? Well, um, after the War of 1812, uh, quite a few bands of Potawatomi left literally from this area, uh, like Lake Creek, and went to Canada. But we have Potawatomi in uh, uh, Northern um, uh, Michigan, and uh, two bands in uh, Southern Michigan, one now in Indiana, Wisconsin, Kansas, Oklahoma. Uh, and so we are the Potawatomi Nation, and, and we are literally in two nations. Um, and uh, we get together socially and culturally. We're now trying to work on uh, economics, and um, we're also trying to get, uh, you know, unify the nation in terms of something that we achieve some of our goals. But there are also national organizations. Um, national NCAI was formed, I think, in the 1940s and 50s. There are also national trade associations. There are social uh, program uh, associations. Um, so yes, there are national organizations and they do good things. We don't have any bands, do well, I think that's what the question was. Alliance. 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 Okay, let me go with the other question. Is there power in working together or is it too hard to overcome internal differences? 
Missouri. Oh, oh, we do work together. The state of Wisconsin, our tribes meet at, um, I forgot what the name of it, I've been out of the loop for a while, but we do have a um, yearly meeting where all the tribes, like their council members, would uh, meet and come up with different things. I know one thing that we raised up is that um, we are all um, Native American, We and so then why can't we use each other's tax exempt? Because we are taxed, we are exempt from paying taxes on the reservation, but we, like I, I own a home, a tribal home. I don't own the land, so I can only sell, if I wanted to sell, I can only sell to a Native, uh, to an Oneida, not even just a Native American, it has to be, um, and, and why? Because that land was Potawatomi, that land was Menominee. Why can't we interchange and intersell, you know? Uh, but we can't. So um, the other things that we have problems with uh, is, is this uh, PL280. Some of the tribes are thinking about going that way, but the cost of it to, to do all the things that the state provides is, um, is, is costly. And you can check Menominee, they have a lot of issues with um, child support and stuff like that. They have to deal with all their um, their uh, foster kids and stuff where well, we, you know, the state helps us out. So um, I think that alliance is, might be what that question was. Um, I'll just say one example. I know of tribes working together. Um, last summer I interned at the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. Um, which basically the 11 ceded territories of the Ojibwe um, way up across Wisconsin, Michigan, and uh, yeah. Um, uh, they all work together um, to uh, help our tribal resources. Um, like our wild rice in Bad River, we have gotten help from a, a lot of other tribes in the area and Glyphic like, promotes um, those alliances because a lot of our um, restoration efforts wouldn't be done alone. Um, so that's just what I wanted to do. Okay, uh, one last question. In regards to missing and, and murdered women, what more can we do to create awareness? Um, I would definitely say uh, finding the, there are, if you have social media, um, like finding those outlets, because I do know um, some outlets do post um, people who are, or indigenous women who happen to be missing. Um, so I guess just promoting that, um, making people aware about the crisis in general, um, because a lot of people don't know what it is. I learned a lot about it like this past year because I went looking for it. Um, it's not talked about on the news. It's, not talked about like anywhere. Um, so I guess just like making yourself known about it, like, and then helping other people un understand and being aware that this is this is happening. Oh, can I ask one more? It's kind of a follow-up to your to your missing indigenous women, and that is I don't know if you're aware of the new TV show Alaska Daily. And I think that has helped in drawing attention to that, that issue. So um, I found out that, um, I, I don't know if you heard, I, you heard anything, but that it was gonna be canceled. And I thought, how disappointing that this great show, which I think is very well done, is not going to continue you know, to bring the, the, this issue, this important issue, to the public. So um, have you heard anything about that? I didn't know that it was being canceled, but I do know about that show. Um, that, that's another uh, thing that I would say. The media is is becoming more filled up, uh, with like TV shows, even if they are fictional. Um, uh, Alaska Daily, also like Reservation Dogs, like these these TV shows, they're fictional, but they're really they talk about really real things that affect Native communities, Native children, Native women. Um, so I definitely say even watching those shows um, could be helpful. Um, but I didn't know it was being canceled. But um, it, 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 natives are becoming more um, prevalent in entertainment and media. Um, so that's another thing. I would definitely say look, look for these TV shows because they're, they're really good and they are really information. So. Is there a national organization that you can contribute to that, that works to, um, to uh, give out information about that to help find these missing women? 
I don't know for sure. I don't know an organization personally, but I there's probably one out there. Um, but if it's happening in Montana, I'm sorry. If there's uh, some that is happening in Montana right now. Okay. Uh, with the Confederate uh, station. I would start with the NCAA, National Congress of American Indians. Um, mm -hmm. Many, many tribes are uh, members of that, and they have they tackle a lot of issues. And if they're not tackling it directly, they will be a, a direct resource to say, go there. You know. We do have another comment here. If you I just had uh, a story I wanted to tell. I, I've been living in. Um, in Montana. Um, oh, I've been living in Montana for about 30 years uh, 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 with uh, Con Confederate Salish and Kootenai tribes and on the tribal lands. And, um, and I've gone to school at the college, uh, the tribal college there, which is fabulous. Um, I learned so much there. Um, they just started teaching history when I first started going there in 1990. Uh, Native American history, really, and, and, and then I went back uh, about 10 years later and they're really digging in. And it's so exciting because when we, when we were talking about, you guys were talking about um, the the harm that the boarding schools did and, and the connection to drugs and alcohol and all of the damage. The education, as I watch this, uh, uh, seems to be the most powerful thing is to get the education about history into everybody. I mean, I, wish I want everybody to go to that school for at least one year. Um, but the story I wanted to tell uh, just quickly was about a, uh, an elder. Um, I was working for tribal lands uh, at the tribes, at the Confederate Association uh, of Kootenai Tribes uh, under, for the Cobell case. And um, there was an elder, his name was Bearhead, and uh, it was me and another woman who was uh, I think she was about one eighth um, Native American, and uh, and so it was very surprising that I would get the job at all because it was Indian preference. Um, but um, Bearhead came up to our desk and he said, um, he said, so you're the two white women causing all the trouble around here. And he was, he was, we talked for a minute, and he said, you know, the trouble with white women. Or no, the trouble with white people is that they have no home. And I remember saying something like, well, I have a home, you know, and he said, where? And I said, here. But what he was talking about was this land. He was talking about, you're talking about sort of checking this off, this off um, this land, what do you call it? Land, uh, land acknowledgement. acknowledgement, thank you. Um, this is serious. Uh, the land and the earth, uh, as he was saying too, um, pretty, I just wish everybody would live on a reservation for at least one year because the education that you get and, and the interaction, as she was saying, that you get just one on one, um, so important. That's all. Thank you for this. Yep. Like in um, what was it called? A smoke? What was it? 
smoke signals. <laughs> I mean, it was just, it, it's just, but I never, never even thought about looking at that. And I'm thankful that we're starting um, to, to uh, let the public know about all the deaths that's been happening in one little area. And when you look on TV, you see um, this lady who's uh, been missing for so many years, and they do all they can to find that one. And I'm like, what are you guys doing about us? What do you do when you have these many people dying and getting murdered and still today? And yet you're still looking for one little lady over here because she's not Native American, you know? It just kind of hurts when you hear that kind of stuff. And I know it's not only for Native Americans, it's Blacks, it's Mexicans, it's all of us who don't have too much money, you know, because that's what it really takes in order to get some, you know, some kind of notoriety about what's going on. And um, I think I better do that in, in uh, the tribe. I'm asking everybody, you watch this movie because it's about ready to go off, you know, so we see it. <coughs> okay, well, I was going to share um, some uh, organizations up here with you. I can write them down really quickly. Uh, MMIWG2S uh, for Missing, Murdered, Indigenous Women, Girls, and Two Spirits. Um, they are working, uh, are some of the groups there. But then also uh, Native, uh, National Native American Boarding School Healing Coalition is another good one to research. If you have a chance at the Kenosha Public Museum, uh, we have, um, I have displays on all of this out there. So there are a lot of resources, a lot of QR codes so that you can um, loop in and learn a little bit more. A lot of um, uh, change makers uh, that are out there uh, working hard in their communities to try and um, uh, make these changes that were discussed tonight. So. If you want to learn more, definitely stop by the Kenosha Public Museum. Um, they're out in the lobby space and a lot of really good information um, and resources as to um, how to access more on the site. So I you know, we'll look into, so I apologize for that. <laughs> uh, you want me to do it? No, not you. Okay. okay, go for it. Um, because this whole, first, first I want to thank our panel members for Fantastic moderator Juan Torres. Yes. And as we come to this portion of the program, a lot of questions have come up about what can we do? What can we do? How can we continue educating ourselves and that sort of thing? So, Bridget, thank you for those resources. But at the conclusion of each of our courageous conversations, we like to leave you with some action ideas, some information, some resources that you may be able to use to continue beyond just this courageous conversation. And so I'm going to ask one of our coalition members, Terry Ruff, to come forward and share some of this information with you. Thank you. Thank you, Adeline. Uh, amazing panel, and I agree, having the young people here just again gives us such pleasure and hope for our future. So thank you for what you're doing. Uh, and yes, we, we, want, we, we all took in a lot, and we want to do something. And we can't all do big things, but there are little things we can think about. And of course, our coalition said, well, what about Thanksgiving? What do we do? Well, that's different. So that's where we kind of started. What about Thanksgiving? You know, we can tell the true story. You heard tonight about things that you may not have heard before or thought about separating those facts from the fiction. We can't change history, but we can make sure it is reflected truthfully. And we can begin a new tradition of gratitude that is inclusive and respectful of Native American history and all that they have done to preserve our land's natural beauty. We heard about that this evening as well. They were here 15,000 years before the arrival of Europeans. That's a lot of years. We can celebrate Native cultures through art, through literature, through the, the many 
forms, the media that, that we've heard about. We can shop native-owned businesses, and yes, you can Google and find them online if you don't know where they are. We can even on our Thanksgiving meal identify foods and Native American origins such as turkey. Might not be the wild turkey, but it's turkey and fish, corn, squash, and wild rice. We, we use those today in our meals. Link them to that culture and prepare recipes by indigenous chefs, and those too are available uh, with a little Google. So continue to share your own family's unique history and traditions along with acknowledging the holiday's deeper and complex history of colonization. So we don't need to nail this by the time the turkey hits the table. This is ongoing and important work that you can do all year round. So some of the things we talked about, educate yourself, understand the reality that included centuries of genocide, theft of land, and oppression. Read those books, articles, and listen to interviews. Now a handout is gonna be available at the, at the door when you leave for some of these options, and they were recommended by our panelists and by the Kenosha Public Library. Read to a young person, a child, a grandchild. The more they can learn about this rich history, the more they too will understand and push back on stereotypes. Incorporate Native American history into nature walks. You take those children for a walk. Think again about the land, about the people that took care of it. Build a foundation of knowing and respecting Native people and seek them out to speak at schools, clubs, and organizations. These four people, everyone we asked, said yes, we'll be here. We were surprised, we were delighted, and again, we are so blessed for the message we received. You can help end stereotypical ideas that are used in mascots and slogans, such as warriors, war paint, headdresses, feathers, tomahawks, tribal dances. You know what they are. You can voice your opinion. Raise awareness. You can do that. Adopt Native American reverence, for nature and natural resources, and do your share to recycle and eliminate litter and pollution. I think probably more than anything, kind of just to sum it up, <coughs> become attuned to inequity and injustice wherever it exists. If you look at everything through that equitable lens, you'll find things to do everywhere. So to get us started on, on that journey, I think Brit, uh, Bridget Nash has something for someone. So if you'd like, we can now you can tell what we are doing with this drawing. Bridget. Okay, so uh, this started uh, here at the Kenosha Public Museum. I started an Act 31 library, um, trying to get uh, tribally uh, written materials into the KUSD classrooms and RUSD classrooms to help teachers uh, treat, teach um, this topic um, in more culturally sensitive and um, with a different through a different lens. So uh, all of the books in my library are written by tribal authors, um, and I know this one in particular that I'm raffling off tonight is also one of Abby's favorites. We're a little fangirl over it. Um, we absolutely love it. Um, but um, some of the books, like Anton Troyer, um, his book um, that I referenced tonight, A Cultural Toolbox, is absolutely fantastic book. Um, he also wrote Everything You Want to Know About Indians But We're Afraid to Ask. It's a really great basic book um, if you're afraid to ask questions to kind of help with some of those misconceptions and stereotypes and to provide a little bit of information. Um, so I have a whole list. If you guys ever want to know, you can just come hunt me down. I'm happy to share my books. I love my books. But so this one is written by Angeline Bouley. Okay, so she is a member of uh, Salt St. Marie Ojibwe. Okay, Firekeeper's Daughter. I don't know, some of you may have written. Yeah, okay, there's a fan too. It's a fabulous book. Okay, so it's, it is based here. Okay, um, so they're real places. It's like 
which I'll start with, but there's a lot of cultural information and it's so relevant, would you agree? Yeah. I mean, it hits on like some of the discussion, Abby of uh, MMIW, okay? It, it hits on all kinds of themes and it's really great place to, and it's an easy read to really start. I know, I talk a lot, sorry. Okay. And for those of you who don't want it, you can get it on, you can go to Birch Park Books on Amazon, like everywhere. Uh, Marcy McDivitt. All right, Marcy. I'll bring it to you. Thank you, Bridget. I, I also like to point out that the book is also available at the Kenosha Public Library. <laughs> and I want to say thank you to Terry for that wonderful presentation. And uh, the entire committee on uh, the Kenosha Coalition for Dismantling Racism for the great work that they did organizing this courageous conversation. Our next courageous conversation will be in January 19th. I will be part of the Kenosha Kindness Week, so if you want to look for details on our social media and in the Kenosha News uh, we'll, as we find out more about it. And again, I want to say thank you to our panelists, Mary Adams, Jeffrey Palfred, Jason Rodriguez, and Abigail Davidson. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> I especially want to thank the museum, the museum staff who stayed late uh, to keep a, uh, stayed late uh, open for us. And so as we're going to be closing up, but first go ahead and grab some re uh, refreshments off the back table and then continue your courageous conversation and continuing your learning. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Bye.